Driving through the Midwest, there's a common sight. Corn and soybeans, nearly 170 million acres. Most goes to feed cattle or create biofuels, but there's a lot that's turned into food for humans. In the United States, fertile land is abundant, but in many other countries, populations have exceeded growing capacity. So for American farmers, exports are huge. For soybeans in particular, about half of all beans grown in the states are shipped off to another country, and the journey the soybean makes from planting to harvest, from container to vessel, from factory to store, is a feat earned by hard work, modern technology, and a robust global trade. My name is David Geiger. I'm an agriculture journalist. I've followed the soybean from being put in the ground to when a sticker is placed on a food called duenjang in South Korea. How it gets there is a story that travels across thousands of miles for more than a year. From the heartland to a plate halfway around the world. Cyclical in nature, the journey of a bean begins where most grain does, in the oceans of fields between major cities. The Illinois landscape isn't much to see just yet in May, but soon roots and leaves will spread. It's a place where the family of Dustin Karstensen has been growing oilseed for generations. Great-grandfather and my grandfather farmed and they milked cows and started farming with my dad. Uh, oh, say 15 years ago, I'd say. Times have changed from when Dustin's grandfather started farming. For one, the price of soybeans have gone from barely $2 a bushel to more than $15 a bushel. Soybean prices will end the 2016 planting season around $10 a bushel. Another difference, in 1960, the United States produced 555 million bushels of soybeans on about 23 million acres. The average then was 23 and a half bushels an acre. This year, Illinois will grow 592 million bushels on about 10 million acres, which will be the biggest crop by state in the nation's 4.3 billion bushel production. It's very neat and uh, rewarding and take a lot of pride in that, um, that, that that's what we're doing and that, you know, there's an actual end user that you can meet the actual person that's manufacturing this food uh, for them. and. Uh, definitely take a lot of pride and um, we tell a lot of people and we're, we're proud of the fact that we're, we're doing this. So it's a, it's a neat process. Dustin is going to be in the planter for a while. He and his family will plant about 8,000 acres this year. For the last decade, they've entered in a deal with Schooler Company, delivering grain to a facility a few miles away from the Karstensen farm. Schooler is one of many companies that make sure U.S. food products make it overseas on time and is the ninth largest grain company in the U.S. by storage capacity. We give the consumptive buyer access to the U.S. producer. Because of McKenna's work as a middleman and the location of the schooler cleaning facility, the Karstensons made a big change to market their food-grade beans at a premium to countries around the world. They went non-GMO. I had just so happened to be delivering a load of corn uh, in there and they were setting up the program and um, talking about looking for some growers to fill some needs that they had and I kind of uh, tuned into it and. Um, we had a, a meeting and uh, we were pretty interested and we jumped in to the program fully. Uh, all our acres, we went to corn and soybeans, all non-GMO. Unlike the United States, where our food can use genetic engineering, many European and Asian countries are a little touchy when it comes to genetically modified products. And they're willing to pay more so a farmer will grow non-GMO. It's a niche market. Farmers who take advantage of demands like this help American trade and their local economy. 
they offer our producers a real market opportunity. A farmer can get a premium for their product if it meets certain attributes, the way it's produced or the benefits that it may provide. If that farmer can find a customer in a foreign market who's willing to pay more for these attributes, that's a great opportunity for us. That allows that farmer to have higher income. He can then generate that through the U.S. economy and it's felt on Main Street as well as in the farm economy. Aside from challenges in trade, there are other problems for Dustin. It's harder to grow crops. Weed control measures cost a lot more and can be less effective than conventional farms. This was especially true when they first started. Dustin will plant into the night on this farm and finish in about a month. For now, the crops have to grow. In early fall, the combine starts rolling, grain carts start hauling, and augers start pumping. The Karstensons will soon see the fruits of their labor. Harvest begins. Dustin graciously takes the time to let me hop in the cab, and I want to see how the season's gone. Very good. <laughs> Very good. It's been a long, long fall. Uh, a lot of weather woes and slow things down, and it's definitely nice to be finishing soybean harvest. 12 to 15 inches of rain in uh, August and September. It just wouldn't stop. Either we'd get one day to run beans before it rained again, or, or we wouldn't even get to run beans again. And when it was uh, not raining, the ground was so wet that we were making, uh, making a lot of mess going on. So. Also, a farmer wants to combine with low moisture content too high and they'll have to spend money to dry it. When you can't trust the weather patterns, harvest can be stressful. A farmer can't start until the morning dew is dried from the stock, which can happen as early as 10 a.m. When they do start, they'll roll all day and into the early morning around 3 a.m. When they can't harvest, they'll load beans and maintain equipment. But after waiting so long to get into the fields, a 20-hour workday is almost looked forward to. This harvest is a farmer's direct income. Every bushel collected is a paycheck saved. Working all day is good, that is, if it's spent harvesting. Just as this field was wrapping up, something got jammed into the combine. Thankfully, the Karstensons have a second one. Oh, that's just standard stuff that happens. You get a lot of acres to go across, and machines have a lot of parts, and. Things are not gonna break and things are gonna go wrong. It's all part of it. And just gotta get it fixed and get back at it and do what you can do. This is the final stretch for the Karstensons. They're nearly done with the corn harvest and they're making headway on the beans. They're taking a quick stop at one of the storage bins. The semi-truck pauses near a trio of bins. 
Seasonal farmhands and friends of the Karstensons are helping out during this busy time of the year. They shove an auger underneath the trailer and roll the hatch open. In the top, out the bottom. Each semi can carry around a thousand bushels of soybeans, which can be an hour or two of a single combine rolling. Farmers want a quick and efficient way to get grain loaded and unloaded. This semi wants to be emptied and back within an hour. But as the sun sets on another late night on Dustin's harvest, it'll be months before these beans head out. Nobody knows just yet, but they are going to South Korea. We make an agreement and then we uh, grow the beans uh, of our choice, the variety of choices that we want to grow that, they, uh, that they're looking for. And then uh, we you know, grow the bean and uh, harvest typically, uh, it's a buyer's call program and uh, we have a, a pretty good amount of storage at the farm and we, uh, we put most of it in the bins. Another tidbit no one knows just yet, U.S. farmers will again export a record amount of soybeans. 2.6 billion bushels will be pushed out for international buyers this year, valued at more than $28 billion. The milestone represents the second year in a row that exports exceeded 60% of U.S. soybean production. For Dustin, farming is part of who he is, and good yields or bad yields, he plans to persevere. Well, the way we farm is pretty much our lives revolve around it. It's our way of life, and we, we definitely uh, take it to heart and try to do a good job. It's May when I get back to the Karstensen farm. The family is getting ready for planting, but I'm getting ready for what happens next. Dustin has gotten the call. His beans have been bought. At his farm, he pulls out the type of bean his buyers want. Then he's taking it over to the schooler facility. It needs to be cleaned and packaged before it can head overseas. It all starts with our customers, uh, either domestic customer or overseas customer, they'll give us a shipping order. And uh, they'll also tell us how they want the beans, how they want them cleaned, uh, and what kind of packaging uh, they, they would like to receive the beans in. And they also give us a desired ETA at destination. The beans from Dustin's farm are about to be cleaned and packaged. But first, Schooler needs a couple samples to grade it. They do a quick test to verify it's not genetically modified. Which is also taken by a third party to be tested in a lab elsewhere. This is food grade and our customers uh, are demanding non-GMO products. Uh, from us, so we also check it for the presence or absence of GMO. The beans can stay in storage for a while. Soon, they'll be augered to the top of the facility. The process is an engineering feat. Gravity separators shake the grain, dividing them into different weights. Soybeans by this stage are an exact science. Grain handlers know weights too high or too low are probably poor quality beans, rocks, or weed seeds. The soybeans go into separator after separator to clean out undesirable parts. Quite safe to eat. Then comes a choice, what bag to put it in. We can do small bags, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, 66 pounds, uh, which would be the same thing as 30 kgs, or we can do 2,000 pound totes, or one metric ton totes, which is about 2,200 pounds. It all depends on the customer. 
Whether buying in bulk or using the metric system, American exporters have to be prepared to sell their product to exact specifications. The process of bagging them is heavily automated here. Bags are filled up and piled onto pallets. They're wrapped up and pushed into a shipping container. This facility and these steps are part of the reason why an American company is trusted by its South Korean buyer. I think almost all the Korean uh, consumers think that the uh, U.S. Uh, agricultural products are well controlled, well tracked, and then they I think they are very much satisfied with the their, their quality control of U.S. agricultural products. It's a lot of work. Food-grade soybeans have to meet higher standards than feed or biofuel. And Schooler takes this seriously, wanting to keep its top 10 status. The facility is capable of producing about 45,000 metric tons of clean product a year. So that's roughly 1.7 million bushels. The soybeans produced by Dustin and cleaned by Schooler will head out in 30 kilogram bags and totes to the buyers in South Korea. We'll see them outside the container on the other side of the Pacific. Once the container is loaded, um, it gets weighed out again uh, because uh, we want to weigh that product as inventory moving out. Uh, we also do a grade to see the quality that we've produced and we check it once again for GMO. I follow the container to a BNSF facility in Joliet, but very quickly it'll disappear among all the cargo. 6,000 crates enter and exit every day. BNSF moves a fourth of the nation's rail freight, operating 1,200 trains per day on 32,000 route miles in 28 states. This facility opened in 2002 and covers more than 600 acres. We handle by far in terms of export uh, the vast majority of soybeans in the country. Uh, and that is principally off of the Pacific Northwest. Machines grab the cargo, placing them on shuttle trains. Each has about 112 cars. About 10,000 tons of grain. So it's a massive amount of product. And we have about, well, currently we have about 140 of those shuttles operating continuously, 24-7, 365. Uh, so we're moving a lot of volume. And uh, the other nice thing about the shuttle network itself is that over the decades, our customers have also invested hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of facilities so that they have capacity not only to handle uh, what the American farmer produces, but also to grow. U.S. infrastructure is quick and efficient in getting goods where they need to go. It's one of the reasons why agriculture products are a gold standard of the world. We've got a really strong infrastructure both of transportation, we've got well-educated farmers, we've got high technology farming, and then we're connected to the world through a river system in the Mississippi, through uh, port systems on the West Coast and the Gulf and the East Coast, and uh, we're a market that people want to do business in, so we're well integrated in the world economy. It starts with how we haul it, which for our business, agricultural products, uh, we have a dedicated fleet of about 30,000 cars, and it goes up and down by a thousand or two. But it's about 30,000 covered hopper cars that are dedicated just to hauling grain. Here we leave Dustin's beans. They're headed to the Pacific Ocean.
U.S. foods deemed worthy by the U.S. Department of Agriculture have a high value by the rest of the world. We are blessed, and one of the, one of the uh, items that I bring up every time I talk to groups outside of the U.S. is the fact that we're not as constrained from a landmass circumstance as many other countries are in terms of their ability to raise uh, crops and food in a sustainable way. We have this enormous land mass, which has been a great gift, and it continues to be productive. So the United States is in a position to produce more than it needs for its own people and therefore can be a provider of food for others in a more efficient way. A large part of the success of American agriculture is trade. The U.S. exports more than 20 percent of the products it grows. For soybeans, 60 percent of what is produced is exported. Well, it is an amazing thing today because you can go back 100 years and yes, we had some trade here and there, but it's just exploded now. And we're to the point of a country that's good at producing X and they can sell it to all the other countries. Uh, I mean, just like my farm in Illinois, uh, we don't try to raise any, uh, uh, any products that would be coming up from South America and stuff like that. I, I don't have any pineapple trees on my farm. So I think with the global economy, is going to be here. There's no escaping it. That lets foreign countries choose to buy U.S. products and then specializing in non-agriculture things for them to produce. Uh, great examples are in Asian countries where natural conditions are not as strong as they are in the United States. They're relatively high population countries compared to arable land uh, and they don't necessarily have the right climate or the right soil to grow the kinds of things that we do. So that sets up the great story of comparative advantage. We do things we're good at, which is agriculture, that allows us to trade with other countries and then they can produce other things that they're good at and both sides benefit. The United States signed a free trade agreement with South Korea in 2007 called CHORUS. It entered into force in 2012 and since then tariffs have slowly phased out. That means that over time we're going to have less barriers to U.S. products and we may even give a preference for U.S. products maybe in a competitive advantage for some of our other suppliers. So South Korea is our sixth largest agriculture market right now. We export almost seven billion dollars of ag products. Uh, that's uh, of the 140 total that we export globally, South Korea makes it into the top 10. We think that as those tariffs come down under the South Korea trade agreement, we're going to do even better that our products will be more affordable to South Koreans and will be more competitive than our customers. The U.S. is great when it comes to getting food products from point A to point B. Other major agriculture nations like Brazil or Argentina have infrastructure challenges, potholes, washouts, backups. And I think you have to uh, for example, compare us to some other countries that are also are large exporters, Brazil comes to mind, uh, whereby they are uh, exporting primarily via truck from the inland to the coastal uh, export facilities on largely unpaved roads. So compare that to our modern and safe and very re reliable infrastructure we have in, in North America, and it really is quite a difference, and I think it gives us a strategic advantage in the world in terms of exporting. They don't have the rail system we have, so they have to transport by truck. And there can be at any point in time, and this is not an exaggeration, at any point in time, a 50-mile link of trucks loaded with agricultural products lined up to provide those products to uh, ships that would then take it to uh, foreign destinations. So while we have a competitive advantage today, uh, at the time it was a 50 to 60 cents per bushel advantage from a pricing standpoint, that could erode if Brazil ever modernizes their infrastructure or if we fail to keep our infrastructure up. And I think our lock and dam system is in need of investment and, and I think our rail system obviously is always in need of investment. After 17 days of travel, the soybeans make it to the port of Long Beach, a 2,000 mile journey, snaking through nine states. The trip was without delay and cargo transferred from train to boat. The port of Long Beach is the nation's second busiest container seaport. Every year, approximately $180 billion worth of goods uh, traverses our gateway. That amounts to about 7 million container units. We rank internationally as a complex, as the ninth largest gateway in the world. So we're a pretty big player in America's major gateway when it comes to imports and exports. 
Every week, 60 trains visit the port of Long Beach. Every day, 25,000 trucks pass through its gates. They carry just about every product made in America. More than $163.5 billion worth of exports will leave California. Soybeans are a small piece of the whole. We are the hub for intermodal connections. So when a train arrives with a container destined for overseas, the container makes its way into the terminal. And at the terminal, the container is loaded onto a vessel. Meaning there has to be a good relationship between rail and port. From the very beginning that the relationship is excellent. Uh, first of all, communication has to be very tight. And it is. We have uh, folks who work here at our headquarters whose job it is to ensure that we have very close coordination with both the, the shipping end of the journey of your soybeans uh, and the destination end, which for us is principally in, in an export corridor like the Pacific Northwest. When the BNSF soybean containers make it to the port, they are stored with thousands of other shipments. They have to wait for imports to be offloaded before making the largest stretch of the journey. The ship will be in port for three to five days. As the middle class in most overseas countries continues to grow, the demand for American food products is increasing. In fact, in just six years, uh, the, the exports of soybeans specifically has grown 30% across the United States. It's a staggering increase for the demand of soybean. So when you look at the exports, uh, the port is, is, is key to the supply chain. Asian customers prefer the reliability of American-grown food. The demand has brought huge upgrades to American ports and ships. Just 10 years ago, the average size vessel calling the port of Long Beach was about 4,000 container unit capacity ships. Today, we see container ships up to 13,000, 14,000 TU ships call on a regular basis. Just to show you how large these ships are, they're 20 stories tall, they're as wide as a 12-lane freeway, they're as long as four football fields, and they're roomy enough to carry 90 million pairs of shoes. But it's not just efficiency. International customers have a strong brand association with American-made food. Our products are safe, they're high quality. Our exporters are able to deliver them to South Korea in an efficient way and we can provide consistent quality and we can provide it on good terms. So on top of that, there is some cachet to Made in USA. And so that I think helps our guys too. So as we help US exporters promote their products overseas, uh, Made in America is a strong brand advantage. The American brand certainly has merit, especially for products like soybeans. That's why third party programs are used. Safety, reliability, and efficiency are all important uh, uh, points of interest for our customers. So yes, uh, we work very collaboratively and very closely with regulatory agencies, law enforcement and safety agencies, just to make sure that the movement of goods throughout our port is safe, efficient, and reliable. That keeps the Port of Long Beach accountable, customers happy, and a smooth transition of products around the world. And here's where the ship takes off. It heads out to sea for the next month. We'll catch up with it on the other side. After a month of traveling by sea, the soybeans I saw leaving the Karstensen farm arrive in South Korea, in Gwangyang port. For about 10 days, they will be vetted by the port and government employees. Usually when the uh, food soybean imported into Korean port, uh, it just uh, uh, go to food processors storage. Uh, it doesn't go to uh, you know, grocery stores for uh, selling as it is. It's, uh, instead, it's just used for food processing. The largest portion is the tofu making and then uh, soy paste, soy milk, like that. So those are the uh, use of uh, for the soybean. The storage is nearby the port. Employees are bustling to get totes onto a semi, the best form of transportation at this point. South Korea is about two-thirds the size of the state of Illinois, but has four times the population. They don't have a, a, an expansive rural area that is capable of producing the food that they need. So the result is that they are very import dependent. Uh, without imports from the U.S., they would have a very hard time making sure that all 51 million of those people are well fed. 
South Korea has a huge import demand for soybeans. The country produces fewer than 100,000 metric tons per year, but needs 1.3 million metric tons. About 300,000 metric tons of soybeans are for the uh, soy food sector. The soy food sector is consists of uh, uh, soy, uh, soybean curd, in other words, tofu, soy milk, soy paste. With the semi fully loaded, these tote bags are headed to a factory in Paju City in the Kyunggi state, about an hour away from Seoul, to be turned into a specific kind of soybean paste called Cheonggukjang. Doc Wa Kim manages production and administration. He makes products, places orders, and is the team leader in the company's support department. He gets his beans later that day. When that's all wrapped up, they go into a conveyor belt where a sensor puts beans into fermentation bags. The fermentation room is a company secret. When the beans have been in there, they're moved to the production room. They're mixed with 2% salt and put into a production line for small, medium, and large sizes, ranging from half a pound to four and a half pounds. 거기서 이제 자동으로 뽑아져, 뽑아져 나오게 되는 그런 제품들은 저희가 이제 포장을 이제 수작을 거쳐서 포장을 하게 되고 이제 스티커는 자동으로 저희가 찍혀서 이제 박스에 포장을 하게 되고요. 이제 박스 포장이 다된 제품은 저희가 냉장 창고로 이송을 해서 냉장 창고에서 이제 보관을 하게 됩니다. 그리고 이제 저희가 주문이 들어오고 발주를 하게 되면 그 냉장 창고에서 보관하고 있던 제품을 저희 이제 냉장 배송 차량을 통해서 Soybean paste like this is found in grocery stores across the country. Soybean paste is a very traditional food in Korea. It's a, a kind of a fermented uh, soybean food. Uh, they add some salt, they ferment it. Similar to tempeh in, uh, in Indonesia or natto in, in, in Japan. But every, uh, each country's food is uh, their own unique uh, properties. Soybean paste is a condiment of sorts, and it's more convenient for the modern family to buy mass-produced options. Dr. Lee says it's just like Americans used to make homemade ketchup or mayonnaise, but now buy it from the store. Same thing happened in Korea. In the past, when we were not that much busy, our life was not that much busy then, uh, even uh, when I was a little child, uh, my mother made the denjang. We call it meju, but the ripe nowadays is very much busier than before. So now you are traveling Korea and U.S. making this documentary. It's very busy life. We don't have much time to make denjang at home. This boxed up product is where we part ways with Dustin's beans. is at the home of Na Hyun Lee, I gratefully accept an opportunity to see how soybean paste is prepared as a traditional Korean dish. 된장이 되기까지 여러 단계를 거쳐요. 콩에서 된장이 되기까지 굉장히 많은 시간이 필요해요. 그래서 된장이 굉장히 중요해요. 된장은 효소 식품이기 때문에 우리 몸에 꼭 필요한 겁니다. 어, 된장을 
한국 전통적인 된장국을 끓이겠습니다. 제일 처음에 She puts water in a cooking pot with seaweed. She boils it to make duenjang broth and mixes soybean paste and a Korean pepper paste. 한국에는 된장 고추장은 항상 냉장고에 보관되어 있습니다. And boils for 10 minutes, scraping off the bubbles. She adds tofu, horseradish, zucchini, onion, and mushroom. She says fish and potato also go well in this dish. At the end, she adds garlic and green onion. When Koreans make duenjang, they use a special Korean bowl to keep the soup hot. The taste is important, but how the dish looks and the color it keeps are also important to Lee. 청국장하고 된장하고 차이점은 청국장은 오래 끓이면 안 좋아요. 청국장은 오래 끓이면 안 되고 그래도 된장국은 오래 끓여도 돼요. 그 대신 너무 오래 끓이면 호박이라든가 어그 양파, 대파 이런 게 맛이 변질져 모양새가 변질되니까 적당히 끓이는 게 좋아요. Lee is the target market for national exporters, but she is old-fashioned. She prefers manually fermented duenjang from her family in the country. The Korean general public's, uh, you know, overall tendency is there is something local food is best. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not saying that the uh, the Korean public uh, doesn't like U.S. or any other imported food. They just like local food. There are Koreans looking to buy food at grocery stores and are not demanding traditional methods of production. I'm thinking that still and then in the future the so, uh, soybean consumption in Korea and Asian market will continue or even grow because nowadays the uh, young people they are be uh, getting aware of the uh, health benefit of uh, soybean like uh, isoflavones and then the uh, omega-3 fatty acid and then uh, the proteins those things are good for them, even for the, uh, how do I call it, uh, uh, their diet program. So I think it's a good one. But duenjang can be like a chicken noodle soup for Koreans. And with that, Lee hands a bowl to me. Duenjang is very tasty. Dr. Lee says the market for soybean products like duenjang won't be going away. We've been eating uh, soybeans for more than, how do I say, several thousand years, at least in, in Korea. So unless our genetic code has been changed, <laughs> I, I, I think the uh, Koreans and then the Asians will uh, continue consuming the uh, uh, soybean and soy, soybean products, soybean food. Yeah. While I may not have been able to follow Dustin's soybeans all the way to a bowl, I think that's an amazing part of the global agricultural system. Our food is mass produced, tested, and shot off around the world. Modern farming and transportation systems allow for a lifestyle where modern society is built. Most people in the United States or South Korea are not concerned about where their next meal comes from. Most people don't know how to grow or produce their own food. They deal with finished products, easily consumable and safe, from a grocery store nearby. Workers can focus on what they're skilled at, students can learn, families can expand, travelers can roam, without needing to devote time to producing their own food. I witnessed that firsthand. Traveling through Illinois, I never thought twice about where my next meal would come from. In Seoul, I encountered hundreds of grocery stores and eateries. I was able to do that through a modern, robust, and encompassing system that gives me the privilege not to worry about one of the most important human needs, food.